The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. The Jews murmured about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that come down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you. Whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the mammoth in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that come down from heaven, and that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. An old Jesuit priest writes, I was a revolutionary when I was young, and all my prayer to God was, Lord, give me the energy to change the world. As I approached middle age and realized that half my life was gone without my changing a single soul, I changed my prayer to the Lord. Give me the grace to change all those whom I come in contact with, just my family and friends, and I'll be satisfied. Now that I am old and my days are numbered, my prayer is, God, give me the grace to change myself. If I had prayed this right from the start, I would have not wasted my life. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as a young man, younger man in a seminary many years ago, I remember myself and my brothers. We all had this simplistic notion that we were going to become priests and we were going to change the world and make it a better place by a holy life, by our preaching, by being present to people. But as the months and years went by in the seminary, we began to realize that the word seminary which comes from the Latin word seminario, seed bed. We began to understand that it wasn't about changing the world. We were in a seminary to change ourselves. We had to change in order to touch the lives of human beings. And I began to understand it isn't about always the crowds. It isn't always about winning everyone to God, to the truth. It's about the fact that I myself had to be one over the God and to give myself completely to him. and to believe in his truth that is revealed to mankind. It's the only way that I could ever touch and affect the lives of human beings. So that enthusiasm, that idea of changing the world 
became transformed into the understanding of changing oneself. Now, we're living in a time today where we all recognize the world needs changing. Ask any parent today, especially if they have young children, they're worried about the world their children are going to grow up in. And they don't like to think about it because it makes them anxious. We don't really know anybody who thinks the world is in good shape. Every day when we get up, anything is liable to happen at any given moment. The human being is anxious today about much, about many things. But I believe we all understand quite well there is something that needs changing. So what do we do in the process? We elect people that we think are going to make a change. And we forget our own personal accountability and responsibility of that change. Of changing ourselves first. And not to count on others. To do it for us. And I think we're living in a time today where we might even throw up our hands and say, well, it's too late. The world is going to go in the way it's going to go, and there's not much I can do about it. I think it's a very fatalistic approach. And I think it's a false approach at the same time. Because we no longer really understand that this idea is a form of defeatism, which is the opposite of Christianity. And it becomes a form of laziness, spiritual laziness. The world needs to be changed, yes. But it'll only be changed if we change. If we Christians change as individuals. If we do not change, we cannot change the world. If we don't change, the world will not become any better. It will continue on its course, its downward spiral. Holiness is to what we are called. If we go back into the early church, the first Christians, they understood quite well. Holiness was a way of life for themselves. They needed to change. They lived differently. They worked differently. They loved differently than everyone else around him. This happened by the grace of God. The first Christians didn't set out to make the world any different. But they changed their culture by living, and by working and loving and acting in a Christian manner. And I remember reading some of the history of the early church, how some Christians were betrayed without ever saying a single word. They would be in the marketplace. They were known for not participating in the Roman orgies, not participating in the games at the amphitheater or the Colosseum the blood sports. They would walk through the marketplace and they would be recognized by the way they carried themselves, by the way they spoke. 
And it was in the middle of all of this struggle and contrast that Christianity grew. First century, the first century was brutal. Beyond the elite who held all the power, people were treated as objects, whose main purpose was to serve the needs of the Roman Empire. This cold, harsh, brutal, and deeply impersonal culture created the perfect opportunity for Christians to shine and rise. And we're living in the same culture today. It's cold, it's harsh, it's brutal. That is deeply impersonal. But in contrast to all of that, the Christians were warm, inviting, kind, generous. The Christians, the experience, for them, it was very personal. Christianity became attractive to the pagans and to the Jews. The first Christians intrigued the people of their time with their selflessness. In the midst of a culture where everybody seemed solely preoccupied with themselves. Do you think much has changed in 2,000 years, huh? Seems like we're almost back to square one. Maybe even worse. But that a Christian would set aside his or her self-interest to help a stranger, a slave, was baffling, but even more so appealing. The first Christian captured the imagination of their age with their love. They took seriously Jesus' directive to his disciples that his followers would be known by their love for one another and love for others. The first century also was dominated by a very strict hierarchical system which created a massive amount of inequality. While in the earliest Christian community every member held equal standing even the lowliest slave was given a dignity and a status equal to that to the wealthiest member of the Christian community. And Paul would often have to remind uh, these Christian communities when they strayed from that unity and equality, he'd have to remind them of the principle of that love and that unity that we share as children of God. In the poverty of those times, the squalor made sickness very common, and the simplest infection could be life-threatening. And this could often lead to the complete destruction of a whole family. And if you couldn't work, you simply died. If a family provider died, and his son, he had sons of working age, even if they were very young, they had to go out and figure a way to provide in some minimal level for the rest of the family. But the saddest part of all, where there were wives and daughters or young girls who had no men to watch over them, they were forced to sell themselves on the street corners. Christianity becomes a community of a social net, not the kind of net we have today, but a living net to support and help each other. Christian communities took care of the sick, nursing them back to health when they could the Christian community provided for the families until they could go back to work. In turn, when others came sick, those that had been healed would provide for those that were sick. So it was a constant regeneration and regiving. 
holiness and love. We're very much a part of the first century Christian life. The idea of belonging to a community that watched out for each other was very attractive compared to the anxiety of everyone fending for himself or herself. This mutual support was astoundingly attractive to people of the early centuries in Christianity. It might even sound too good to be true, but it was true and real. It is the history of our church and our Christianity. It was open to all men, women, and children, regardless of language, color, culture, financial status. It didn't matter. You were a member of a family, the Christian community. Of course, as you know, every, not everything was positive. If you became a Christian, you took your life into your hands because you opened yourself up to social estrangement, hostility from neighbors, persecution and betrayal, and even being persecuted by your own family members. We only have to read the history of the early centuries that the church Parents who betrayed their children, children who betrayed their parents, brothers and sisters, and so on and so on. Just to get back or to get even with someone. So not everything was rosy as a Christian. It would be a mistake to simply over-spiritualize the success of that early Christianity. But it was deeply rooted in the life, death, and resurrection and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Keep in mind, the early Christians had no Bibles. The early Christians had no churches. But they had the Eucharist. Then they had each other. Today we got thousands of Bibles, there's not millions of them. We got more churches than we can ever count. Yeah, we still have the Eucharist, thanks be to God. But we are more divided today than Christianity throughout the Christian ages. Having Bibles in churches has divided us. Crazy as that may sound, it hasn't made us any better. Christian against Christians. How many wars have been fought through the Middle Ages? Christian fighting each other. And a sad part of all today in a modern world We can no longer rely on each other for help. We come together on a Sunday or a Saturday. But we leave here, we go our separate ways. Helping others in need. This is so much our thought anymore. The early Christians clearly differentiated themselves from the dominant culture of their times. But the Christian today blends in. He's just like everybody else. But the sad part of it being the culture today is proactively hostile towards each and every one of us. As Christians, and we don't care. We figure that somewhere along the way it's going to change, but it won't. 
He won't. We need to learn once again, like the early Christians, to change ourselves, to live with generosity, kindness, patience, courage, thoughtfulness, and selfless care for the weak, the poor, and the forgotten. Now, if you look throughout Christian history, you'll discover something very interesting. The idea of a hospital, the idea of a nursing home, the idea of taking care of travelers, those that are of feeble mind or body, all that comes from us. It comes from the Catholic Church. We founded it all on a principle of helping others. In the Middle Ages, there were entire Christian communities of men and women who were founded simply to work in a hospital. to work in a retirement home, to take care of travelers with no pay, no money. Everything was donated, everything was given. Then God provided. But as soon as the industrial revolution hits us, everything becomes commercialized. Oh, there's a way to make some money. Let's take over some hospitals, huh? We'll start, we'll start charging people thousands and thousands of dollars to get healthy, huh? When it used to be all for free. It didn't matter what God you believed in. If you were sick and you needed help, you could go to one of these hospitals without questions and be taking care of a nurse back to health. We sold out. We sold the best part of ourselves and the opportunities that God gave us. Now all we do is sleepwalk through life. And we've learned to do it now collectively as well. It's time to wake up. Christianity is being attacked by secularism and intolerance and indifference. And there are forces that would like to see Christianity wiped off of the face of the earth, if at all possible. But there's nothing more attractive than holiness. In 1950, an Albanian-born school teacher stepped into a classroom, quietly sat down with God in prayer and said, the world is in a mess, Lord. How can I help? Her name was Agnes. And she felt God was calling her to work with the poor. Agnes didn't run down to the local soup kitchen. She went into the filth and squalor of the worst neighborhoods in Calcutta, India. Each day she woke up. She went to Mass. She spent an hour in Eucharistic adoration. Prayed her rosary. Talked to God. and spent the rest of the day working with the poorest of the poor and cared for them if they were Jesus himself. In less than 20 years, she captured the imagination of an entire world. A single person, Mother Teresa, 
Saint Mother Teresa. She was loved, admired, and supported by all, by all faiths, even those who had no faith. Why? The answer is simple, really. There's nothing more attractive than holiness.